<laughs> anyway, okay, my name is Mitchell Moat, and I'm extension agent here. And we're going to spend the next few minutes this morning visiting uh, on this title, All Brown Patches Aren't Brown Patch. You know, why in the world would, would we have a session entitled that? Well, it's because uh, here at the, the local extension office, this time of year, we, we receive a number of calls from individuals that uh, they, they have done some research and they have read about this thing called brown patch disease. And, they're gonna, and they'll say, you know, my, my lawn has these brown patches in it. In places where grass is dying, I must have brown patch disease. Do you think that's it? Could you come and look at it? So, so we'll come and look at it. And, and, and very seldom is it brown patch disease. Uh, uh, and, and, and so we're going to talk about that and how to tell the difference. <laughs> so therefore, all brown patches aren't brown patch. So the definition from a turf grass perspective, because we've got to be on the same page, we're going to need to be talking the same language here. So what brown patch okay, is a fungal disease that will attack multiple species of turf grasses. But by far and away, it is the most common disease problem on tall fescue here in our location. Uh, it's caused by the, 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 the numerous rhizoctonia species of fungi. There's, uh, there's more than one of those that cause it. There's a warm season brown patch, there's a cool season brown patch, and we tend to see more on, on removed grasses and such. That's not really a big issue for us. The biggest issue for us is the warm season brown patch. You say either on Bermuda and fescue is it, common? It, it, the brown patch will attack all species of grass. And it, some attack more different times of year, like on the cool, the cool, uh, uh, wet uh, uh, spring seasons, and so on. It's worse on the moon grass than it is on uh, on the fescue research. You know, in the hot, humid weather, is when we expect to see this develop on the tall fescue. Uh, it, it is in most home lawn settings, it's not a big issue on the moon grass, uh, but on tall fescue, by far and away, it is the most common disease we'll see, and it can, it can be relatively devastating. Um, because it can sure take out large patches, and, and we'll talk about that. But again, it is, it is a fungal disease, as most diseases of grasses and other plants are caused by fungi. And this just happens to be the rhizoctonia species, there are multiple species uh, that will do that. Now, a brown patch is a patch of grass that used to be green. All right, it used to be, at some point during the growing season, it was green. Now, depending on the level of use or how much traffic it gets, that may turn into just a bare spot of dirt or might even be mud hole kind of wet. Okay? But, so, so brown patch and disease, and a brown patch is a brown patch. And so, now, who cares? Okay, who cares? Well, <laughs> exactly. And this fella, the, the people that this billboard was made for are the ones who care. If they care enough to run kids out of the yard with a BB gun, they probably care enough about the lawn to know, want to know what those brown patches are and what they can do about it, if there's anything they can do about it. All right, so if, 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 you, if your goal is to have a lush, green, actively growing, pretty pure, consistent, high population, high population density lawn, you can't address the problem of a brown patch if you don't know what the cause of it is. Okay, so that, that's the whole point of doing this for this talk right here. And, and that is local. Uh, so, let's talk about the disease itself. Some visual symptoms of brown patch disease. So, we can rule that one out, or you, you, you can understand what it is and maybe rule that out. Okay? So, here we go. What happened? There we go. Okay. Uh, it's called brown patch because the disease will create numerous patches of brown grass in the lawn area itself. They can start off small and they'll expand. They're generally circular in nature, but they're not going, they're not going to necessarily follow a, a true circle pattern, but generally they're circular in nature. You can have an individual circle may get up to say three feet in diameter, and you may have another one right here, and they may join together. So you may have you know a six inch or, or excuse me, a six foot or a ten foot circle. But when these things grow together, they have large big spots and start off with small brown patch, but they continue to grow as the seed goes by. Uh, if you look in the, the center, and this is the point of the all on the screen, but in the, in the center of those patches, or, or inside of the perimeter of the patch, usually there is some green grass in there. Very seldom will brown patch kill all of the grass in the patch. Okay, So if you've got the brown patch 
and you still got some green grass in there, well, that's a good sign, and maybe that's what it is, is brown patch. But also, the time of year it is, has something to do with that. But if you look inside that patch, and in those green spots that are in there, on the grass blades themselves, and, and all fungal leaves are gonna cause some kind of lesion, okay, or a spot on the foliage. The brown patch disease leaves a straw-colored, tan-colored lesion on the leaf blades, and it's got usually a darker perimeter. It'll be a, a dark brown, like, like khaki and brown combination. So the, the, the lesion itself is kind of khaki colored and the edge, the margin of the lesion is a darker brown color. So you're going to see that at, inside the patch where the green grass is left alive, and also at the edge of the patch when this thing is straight. Now, this is a surefire indicator in the brown patch. Look at this a little closer. If you go to this patch of grass that's turning brown, and you go out early in the morning before the sun comes, but well not before the sun comes up, but before the sun dries the dew off while it's still wet, very often you're going to see, plus well, this, and this is this is the smoke reading, okay? This is kind of a classic symptom, boy. If you see that, you're pretty sure you got brown patch. Now there are some other fungal diseases too that will, will have something like this, but this is this is the disease growth. Right. These are these are mycelium from the fungi. They're growing out of the plant and that thing expanding. It's going to be on the outer edge of the ring. When the sun comes up, it dries to do off and it kills these things. They dry up. And so they're not out there expanding anymore. But when the sun goes down, it's you got some humidity, you got some moisture on the grass, they'll pick back, they'll put it up off and it just spread. But if you look, even in this picture, and this is this is local brown patch. This is not imported brown patch. Mm -hmm. But if you look inside the picture, like here, the green blades that you see uh, in, on those green blades left inside, you see those straw colored lesions in there. The straw colored areas. And if you look at them close, you can see uh, that they very much look like the pictures we saw previously. But you've got the expanding ring, uh, you, you get the, the, the mycelium, the smoke ring look to it. And that's a pretty sure sign that these brown patch disease. So then, okay, if you see that, you know what you're dealing with. No question about that. So what what causes, what influences this brown patch? First of all, the, those those fungi are pretty much out there. They're just in the environment. You know, it's not that. Uh, well, we had a, a bunch blowing in from Mexico or somewhere. Now some fungal diseases, they, they, they don't overwinter. Uh, but this one does. And a lot of fungi got overwinter here. They, they, they survive year round. They're present somewhere in the environment all the time. Some have to be blown in. Okay, they, they won't, it, it's too cold here for them, etc. But this one's not one of them. So they're out there in the ground. Okay, they can the fungi in the ground. Uh, you're not going to have an issue with brown patch until you have some hot, humid weather. And, and you really think about humidity at night. If, if you wanted a good, rule of thumb to go by, when it, when it gets to the point where it's sticky enough at night, that you're not comfortable just the windows open, you need to shut the windows and turn the air conditioning on, then that tells you you're getting into the kind of, uh, of environment temperature wise and humidity wise that, that brown patches have to flourish. Okay? And, and you know, in order for any disease to develop and to survive, it's got to have three things. It's got to have a host that will, that is susceptible to it. So that's your grass. Okay? Your tall fescue, all tall fescue is susceptible brown patch. You may see advertisements that say, you know, brown patch resistant. That's relative. It's all relative. The resistance uh, is, is more of a factor of how much of it survives an attack versus is it going to be infected with brown patch because all tall fescue is susceptible brown patch. Some will have a greater degree of survivability than others. That's where the, the resistance comes from. Uh, so you've got a host there that's susceptible to it. So that'll work. Then you've got to have a pathogen. Well, it's out there all the time. And then you've got to have the right weather conditions. So that, that's the big thing right there. It's not just weather conditions, but just, just the physical environment or weather conditions part of it. Uh, it. Untimely and excessive use of irrigation. Okay? Uh, untimely. What does that mean, untimely irrigation? Well, we, if we think about it being humid at night, Water in the Watering in the afternoon so that it does not dry off good before the sun sets. That would be untimely. To, to minimize this disease development, the grass 
you know, it needs to be dry when it goes when the sun sets on it. So you don't want to ruin your irrigation. If you've got an irrigation system, it, it, whether you, whether it's an in-ground system, whether you're dragging hoses and sprinklers, you know, you need to run those so that the grass has a chance to dry off before the sun goes down. I mean, in reality, if you want the best use out of the irrigation system, early, early. Uh, you know, it doesn't have, the sun does not have to be up, per se, if you start these. Well, so, so what's the difference if by running it early when it's dark versus running late when it's dark? Because when you run it early, the sun is going to come up pretty soon and it's going to dry things up for you. Uh, you run it late, if you run it 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the afternoon, it's got several hours of dark on there that makes a good environment for this stuff to grow. So that's the difference. So you want to, if you're going to use irrigation, do it early in the day. Okay, early in the day. And that also cuts down on evaporation laws and that sort of thing because you're not hot. Uh, and, and very often early in the morning you won't have as much wind as you will uh, at later times in the day and that can change your irrigation pattern and blow it off. So, so poor soil drainage. If you've got soil that does not drain, anybody have clay soil? I have clay or soil here. Yeah, yeah. Everybody stick their hand up. Or, Don't worry, I'll do it for you. You do. Okay, you do. Um, that's good though because it helps all the world again. If you're in clay there, this thing would be falling apart. But if you get enough clay, it doesn't drain very well. And, and so it wants to hold moisture and it makes a good environment then for this, for this fungi to live. Okay, so, so poor soil drainage also influences the, the development of brown patch disease. Uh, <coughs> some of these things we don't have any influence on. We can influence that, or we can influence the irrigation. Soil drainage, we can influence it some, okay? It's kind of questionable. Well, to what degree would we influence it? This one we can influence, excessive nitrogen fertilization late spring and summer. If you've got a cool season grass, if it's a tall fescue, or if it's a, a, a tall fescue boolean, if it's a tall fescue mixture, you've got a tall fescue, maybe a little bluegrass, maybe a little pruning ryegrass in there. Our, in our University of Tennessee recommendation is you don't add nitrogen, you don't use nitrogen to feed that grass after the middle of late. Okay, that's the latest you can do it in the spring. And, we don't suggest you use a lot of nitrogen in the spring period on those grasses because it, 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 see, it, it's, a, it it's kind of a, 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 well, I hate to know, you know, the word just leaving, but it, it, it's a catch 22 sort of thing. You want the grass to be strong and healthy, so you want to fertilize and feed. Well, brown patch and, and most diseases don't affect poor, slow growing grasses and poor quality. They affect the, the lush, dense, high quality grasses because they make a better environment. Uh, you think about that grass growing really, really fast, okay, lush growth, dense growth, you, you have less air movement through there, so you create kind of a micro environment, micro climate down there. It's really, really better suited than those thin populations of grass that got more air movement through and so on. So, we don't suggest that you apply nitrogen any time after the middle of April. And throughout the course of the spring, unless, you know, the spring, uh, we're going to say start sometime in March, and not necessarily by the calendar, but by the season, by the way when the grass starts to grow. We don't suggest that you apply more than a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet for the whole spring period. So by the time that grass starts growing uh, all the way through the spring into the summer, we don't suggest you apply more than a pound of actual nitrogen per thousand square feet. That's not a pound of fertilizer, that's a pound of nitrogen. Okay, yes sir? Is that the same for Bermuda too? Bermuda is a totally different season, and, and it's not going to really start growing until probably you get up in April. And, and our, our point here is to fertilize the grass when it can best utilize. So since Bermuda grass is a hot season grass, a warm season grass, we're going to do the fertilization on it roughly around again the middle of April and about every six weeks up until the first of September. So it's, it's kind of the opposite fertilization schedule of I mean, tall fescue. Because on tall fescue and uh, those other cool season grasses, okay, now cool season grass grows in cool weather, spring and summer, hot season grass grows in, in, in the sun, in the winter time is going. So if, if you were, what's, if you, if your goal is to have what's, what, what, what the soil now refers to as, as high quality or highest quality, then we're gonna, you're going to do three fourths of your fertilization on a cool season grass September 1, October 15th, November 15th. That's kind of rough. So you're going to do three fourths of that fertilization in the late summer, fall time period. Very little of it in the spring then. On the Bermuda grass, Zoysia grass, centipede, well, not so much centipede because it doesn't fertilize. 
but removing zoysia grass, just the opposite of that, you're going to do, if we're talking roughly the same amount of nutrients on both types mm -hmm. of grass, we're going to do April, June, July, and, and by the first September, we'd like to be finished with it because it's going to start going to sleep and it needs to chance to transition out and get into the storms. Mm -hmm. So, I, and I said, you know, we don't recommend more than a pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet total in the spring of the year. That's not a pound of fertilizer, that's a pound of the nutrient. So depending on what you use for fertilizer, it, that influences how many pounds that is. For example, if you use, and, and there are uh, nitrogen only fertilizers, the a common one is a 3300. Okay, all it has nitrogen. Well, that takes three pounds of that fertilizer to yield a pound of nitrogen. If you had a, a, a 20 zero zero or 20 whatever, but, but nitrogen is first number, so 20 in that case for it's nitrogen, but it would take five pounds of that. Okay, if it were triple 13, and that's that's a, and, and the numbers represent nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in that order. Okay, always been with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. The numbers are preceding this, that's what they are. So if it were triple 13, to get a pound of nitrogen, you're talking about seven and a half pounds of fertilizer, something like that, less than eight pounds, between seven and eight pounds of fertilizer, give you a pound of the nutrient cell. So when we say a pound of nitrogen, we're talking nutrient, not fertilizer, and the pounds of fertilizer will vary depending on what you use as a fertilizer. All right. So we can control, out of those factors that influence brown patch development, we can, we can control one of them, or we can control two of them, for sure, we have a little bit of influence on soil drain. Well, what about treatments? If you have brown patch, if you do have it, is there anything you can do about it? Well, yes. Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Now, if it's a fungal disease, what's the medicine for a fungal disease? A fungicide. Okay, fungicide. All right. Here's an example of one. This is in the brand names. Oh, brand names are just that's what they are. Brand names. There are lots of different brand names, and they'll all. Be. There's only so many things out there. So many compounds they can use. This one, and you look under active ingredients, this one has the active ingredient propiconazole. Okay. You know, another common one is chlorothalonil. Uh, another common one is myclobutanil. But, but all of them will say on here, prevents and stops, this one says it prevents and stops major disease on roses, flowers, lawns, trees, and shrubs. Okay. Does that cure anything, does it? Hmm? It says it prevents and stops. You're not gonna find many fungicides that will tell you that they cure anything. Because they don't, not really. Uh, even if the label says curative rate, that's questionable. That's very questionable. Fungicides will protect uninfected plants, and therefore they stop the spread by doing that. Okay. So when it says prevents and stops, if if if, if a plant is protected with a fungicide, then you have prevented it from becoming infected, and if you have treated infected areas. In the uninfected areas, you have stopped it from spreading to them. So that's what that means. Okay. Well, is it is it realistic to do it? Well, it depends on your point or, or what's your definition of realistic kid. Now, in this example, okay, this is infused fungicide. Uh, uh, it does have some systemic activity, meaning it, once it's applied to the plant, it will move into plants some. Okay. Some are contact only, they only protect where they hit. Alright, so if you've got a contact material, then you, you need very good coverage because you only protect what you hit. Okay, with a systemic material, complete coverage is not as critical because it does move inside the plant. So, so if you got some systemic activity, that's a plus. Okay, because then that takes out a little bit of operator error. All right. But so the whole point of this is a 16 ounce container. And I don't know whenever I bought this. It, this is not new, uh, but it's it's no more than five years old enough. At that time it cost fourteen million. 16 ounces. Well, now, I always read the label. The label back here on the back of it, very fine too. I'm going to tell you what the label says in terms of rate. For brown patch, this 16 ounces will treat 800 square feet of lawn here. Okay, treat 800 square feet of lawn here. Uh, and, and it's recommended to make the application at 10 day intervals during the period when disease uh, uh, development is likely. How long are we talking? Well, 
most years we're talking about sometime in May is when we normally start getting into weather conditions and physical conditions, environmental conditions that will uh, support the development and growth of brown paste. And then that can continue on up in through August. So there are a lot of 10-day periods between whatever point in May and whatever point in August that this stuff shuts off. Now, if you have a real dry spell or drought, you don't worry about it because it's not active and you don't have much moisture. If you have a cool snap, it's not active. Okay, it's got to be uh, above 68 degrees anyway at night, usually for this to be an issue. Okay, so but from a cost standpoint, this, this is $1.87, uh, excuse me, it's $18.73 per thousand square feet. That's what it costs. So for a 10,000 square foot lawn, that's not a huge lawn, but 10,000 square foot lawn, it's $187 to treat one time. Now we're talking about at 10 day intervals. Well, in a month, you know, in a month, theoretically, you could have uh, three times at nearly $200 a pop. So it gets, that's why, that's why if you, if you, if you use a long service, and they, they, they generally always the lawn service will include as part of their packages or as part of their basic, their standard pattern, it's going to include fertilization, it's going to include weed control. It may even include insect control. But very, very seldom, I don't know if any of you ever see a standard package that includes disease control. Because of disease control depends. Now, there are products that will last a little longer. It may give you up to 21 days, but that's still not a super long period. But the point is, fungicide treatments are expensive. Okay. They're expensive. Why can't you just spot treat it? Where you, you can, you can, but but the idea, or you know, if we think about it from the standpoint of if we, we're going to assume that the disease organism is there anywhere, in any one spot. So if it starts developing here, so we go over here, so we got a spot here, so we treat five feet around that spot. Okay, we protected that, but then it pops up over here, so then we just start running around. You, you, absolutely, you can do that. Is it effective? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, now, the one thing is for sure is we don't have to do anything because usually tall fescue seed is cheaper than fungicide. And so when you get into the fall of the year, that's when we think about doing some annual overseeding anyway to thicken up those thin down areas. Something else we can do is minimize those favorable disease conditions. And one is uh, don't don't plant or excuse me don't water at the wrong time. If you're going to irrigate, irrigate at the right time of the day. Uh, we we don't fertilize after uh, the middle of April in school season grasses. Um, I can't remember if I include this on the next slide. Okay, here we go. Yeah, improve soil quality and drainage when you establish it. So when you build a yard, okay, when you establish it the first time. If you can improve drainage and soil quality, how do you do that? Add organic matter. Compost is good stuff. If you can add compost, mix it into that soil, when you get ready to establish a new lawn, then do it. Okay, do it. Because that's going to improve drainage. Uh, and, and there's some, there, there, there's some evidence maybe that just the organisms that are, that are common in compost can have some disease suppressing qualities to them. So there may be lower populations of the, 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 the organism, the fungi, that causes some of these diseases uh, if you've got a higher concentration of compost in the soil. So that's a plus too. Uh, but most of us have already got our lawns built. Okay, they're already there. So what can we do about that? Okay, how can we add compost or add organic matter to an existing soil? Well, one way, and, and this is a way that will allow you to add organic matter to an existing turf without, without totally destroying the existing turf. And that is to core aerate it. You know, whether you've got the little pool behind it, you buy the garden center and pull behind the lawnmower, or the little rental store to get the walk behind the model or the professional pull behind models, you core aerate so that you are punching holes in the ground, you put the cores of soil out on top, and then you top dress it. And all that means is you apply a layer of compost over the top of the turf after you hit the core aerate. Now we're not, I'm not talking about a thick layer because you can't, you can't realistically work a real thick layer into those holes because that stuff needs to move in those aeration holes that you create. So probably a half inch is about what you can realistically and efficiently do a good job of incorporating at a time. So it's work, 
Okay, it's work. You can do it all by hand. With, well, you can't core everything by hand, but you can you can uh, core everything, and then pot, you can buy compost. You just, you, you compost is good material. It's good material. Uh, you can buy it in bulk. Uh, most garden centers, for example, the uh, the mulch company just down the street at Park Drive and sell a lot of mulch. They sell compost. You can buy a pickle load of compost. You, and, and, and generally, it's cheaper to buy in bulk than it is in bag. Okay, but if you don't have a, a vehicle hauled in, you buy bags and haul that. Okay, you compost the cow and you compost the poultry. You spent mushroom compost. Uh, that's probably a manure base too. It's where mushrooms are grown. It's not compost for mushrooms, but it's the media that mushrooms are grown for people. Uh, so you, you take and you spread that out, and you do it by hand over the lawn, and then take take a, a drag mat. It can be a piece of chain link fence that you cut uh, and, and, and put a two or four on either end of it, and you drag it behind the drag behind your lawnmower. Uh, a piece of the, some of the flexible metal. Uh, this this uh, I don't know I don't really know what it's called, but it's like expanded metal. It flexes. It's very flexible, and it's kind of like chain link. It's got a little more rigidity to it than the chain link fence has. Uh, and you just drag it slowly across so that you're moving that that compost encourages you to go into those channels. So that's a way to, to add some organic matter and improve soil drain. Okay, that, that's something we can do. Uh, and, and again, avoid that excessive nitrogen fertilization, those cool season grasses. No nitrogen after the middle of April. All right, no nitrogen after the middle of April. Well, we're not talking about weed control today, but if we were, and, if, 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 and, and generally folks that are concerned about this, they're looking for a fairly high quality turf. Okay, so crabgrass is an issue for them. Because that takes away from the quality of the turf, crabgrass does. Well, crabgrass is an annual grass weed, so we can we can prevent it to a large extent by using a crabgrass preventer. Normally, you're looking at a couple of applications throughout the season to give you the best control. To so do an application early in March, and then eight, ten weeks later, do a second application. Well, so let's say we did it uh, in March, and we did March first. Okay, so, so four weeks later we're at April 1st, and four weeks later we're at May 1st, and then we're at May 15th, 10 weeks, we're in the middle of May. Well, a lot of crabgrass preventer or, or pre-emergent herbicides are packaged with fertilizer. You know, fertilizer with crabgrass preventer. It's easy. Well, that first application, that makes a lot of sense because the call fescue can utilize it, the, 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 the bluegrass can utilize it, the fertilizer, and, and it's, you get the benefit of the preventer. But, if you get past the middle of April, I don't recommend that you use the fertilizer with the pre-emerge on these cool season grasses because we don't want you to put that nitrogen out there. So then you think about, you know, using if you're if you're looking for that second uh, crabgrass application, use one that doesn't have any nitrogen in it or just one that's not attached to fertilizer. So that's my point about that. But we want to avoid nitrogen fertilization after the middle of April. Okay, yep. Okay, and, and then again avoid that late afternoon irrigation. So the grass goes to Goes to bed with a dry head, not a wet head. Okay, so causes of brown patches in lawns. That's, that's, any, any question about brown patch disease? Okay. Yes, sir. If uh, retention of moisture is uh, conducive to producing it, but <coughs> mowing your grass at a higher height keeps the weeds down. It does. It, then you're cutting down the, by mowing it higher, you cut down on the air circulation because it's thicker and taller. Therefore, there's more moisture in there. That well, it, the, it, it creates to, a more there, productive environment for brown. There, there's some truth to that. Uh, there's some truth to that. Uh, and, and so, in, in the, in the, from the disease control standpoint, my recommendation would be to cut the grass at the higher end of its recommended range. And for tall fescue, or excuse me, the lower end of its recommended range. For tall fescue, in the spring, I would suggest you mow it much less than two and a half inches. You know, it's the spring and the fall of the year. Uh, and when you start moving out of the, the good growing conditions in the hotter weather, drier weather, we start thinking about raising it up some. But so you gotta try to strike a happy medium. Uh, one thing about it, it it's, if the grass is dead, we don't worry about getting brown patch. <laughs> So that's that's something else I guess to think about. But from from the from the retaining moisture standpoint, I, I, I'm as much concerned about drainage in the ground as I am just just 
the moisture the, 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 the moisture being held in the canopy of the grass itself from the uh, from from harboring the disease standpoint but now you're right the more free water you have on that grass blade for longer especially in the evening because the sun helps you know, on cloudy days it's more of an issue at night it's more of an issue than on sunny days because the sun helps slow that down it doesn't spread as fast when the sun shines that's why the, the, the sun in the morning burns the, the mycelium off of smoke you don't see okay but other than the disease itself okay uh boy there's a common one okay why what is that deal shallow soil okay septic tanks why does the grass grow the septic tanks because you've got a shallow layer of soil grass will grow the septic tanks up to a point and then when it dries out it dies because it just not knows how much soil does it take to, to maintain and stand the grass well if, if you don't have six inches and I'm not saying that six inches is enough. It's not, it's not the, it, it's not, I'd like to have more. But if you don't have any six inches, you're going to be hard pressed to maintain with any kind of consistency of good standing grass stuff. If everything else is, in, 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 if everything else is perfect, yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. But six inches is about the minimum. Okay, that's about the minimum. Uh, you think about a tall cup versus shallow cup. You know, that tall cup will hold more water than, than, a, than a short cup. Well, a, a deep soil will hold more water than a shallow soil. We talk about grass needing somewhere in the neighborhood of a, an inch of water per week, which is, equates out to 600 some odd gallons per thousand square feet. Does that mean it's got to rain that much on it? You got to irrigate that much on it? No, that means it has to have access, the plant has to have access to that much water. The plant doesn't care if it's stored water, you know, that it is taken out of the ground, because when you think about it, when it rains on it, the water going in the ground before the plant uses it anyway. So a deep soil will store more inches of water than a shallow soil. And that's why you get things like this showing grass doesn't grow the um, Now this, whoop, back here. this picture, that was April of 20. Okay, and I'm sorry. Can you see it there from when I stand there? It doesn't look all that good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we got a branch, and this was grass that was sown in the fall. Okay, tall fescue sown in the fall. And you can still see the little straw. There was mulch right here. This is, this is straw with open mulch. Well, this area is brown time. That's early. That's early for brown patch. Why would it be having brown patch? It's not having brown patch. You run a soil probe in there, you got about an inch and a half of dirt, and that's it. Okay? Shell of soil. And when, when, how many of you uh, uh, had a dry spell uh, the first you know, week? In my house, for the month of May, I had recorded an inch and a half of water. That's how much for the whole month of May. So until, what was it? Friday the 15th of May. I mean, we've gone three solid weeks without a drop of rain. And we kind of got hot. We've been up, you know, pushing 90 degrees and so on. Well, I was, it was getting to the point where I could start seeing my rocks work. I could see the outline of the rocks because it was drying out in the grass. I mean, that was my second time, okay, there. So it, it browned out. It browned out first week without any rain, 90 degrees. Uh, that shallow soil will start telling. Okay, it doesn't take long. It starts telling. So that's a, that's, a, that's a common reason for having brown patches. And people, uh, we get calls like this pretty often. Uh, in the spring, in uh, 2012, when we had the drought, okay, we started off fairly decent in the spring, had a somewhat decent spring, but up into April it started getting a little bit dry. Folks were using lawn services and they were getting their yards treated. They get brown patches in your yard. And what is the deal? And I carry, I carry a soil probe in the truck because invariably, well, not every time, and in lots of those cases, you go to those brown spots and try to run a probe down, you can go any far. You go to the green places, you can go down this far. It makes a big difference. And those shallow spots just brown out a lot faster. Now, another cause of those brown patches in the grass is when you have annual wheat grasses that die. Now, these are our, probably our, our three main culprits right here. Got crabgrass up here in the, on the left corner, and your bluegrass in the center on the top, and the little barley. In the center of the bottom. Annual bluegrass and little barley are cool season annual grasses. Crabgrass is a warm season annual grass. So the fact that they're grasses mean that they're botanically they're closely related to our turf grasses. So that makes them a little more difficult to control after they're out and growing because chemistry that will control grasses does a good job of controlling grasses. Uh, whether it's a Crabgrass or any bluegrass or a tall fescue. So there's not as much selectivity on those post applied products as there are on some pre applied products in the grass work. 
how they're so closely related. So the issue then is, okay, so the, the, these cool seeds grasses, bluegrass and little barley, well, they germinate about the same time, let's say you're overseeding in the fall of the year, tall fescue and bluegrass, stuff like that. Well, that's when this stuff germinates too. It germinates usually after the, or around the early part of September on up in the fall. That's when it starts. So, so a person could go in here and, and, and we'll back up and say, these are all, look, look one of those, well, the crab right there, those of you on the seat, they'll take in March. Okay? But now the bluegrass over here, that's, uh, well, that was also in March too. But that stuff's germinated back in the fall. Okay, so it's had all winter grow. It's winter spring. Look at all the seeds, man. Little barley, little seed heads on Okay, the crabgrass can make seed too. That's where those, that's how those things uh, uh, propagate. They reproduce by seed, and they're very prolific seed producers. So every one of those that makes a viable seed, and that seed is shattered and goes into the ground, it goes in the seed bank. So any seed, any plant that grew there previously, it made a seed, then it made a contribution to the seed bank. And, and at some point when conditions are right, that seed's gonna try to germinate and grow. So what happens if we if we overseed and fall the year to improve our tall fescue and such as that was proved in the first? Well, we, we're going to cultivate the ground some. Maybe we're going to core aerate it really hard. Maybe we're going to defash. Maybe we're going to slip seed. But we're still disturbing the soil. Well, disturbing the soil sometimes improves conditions for these weed seeds to germinate too. So what can happen is we sow our tall fescue. We, we do our cultivation. We sow our tall fescue, and grass starts germinating. Well, it looks pretty good. It looks pretty good. And your bluegrass and tall fescue seed, and you can't tell much difference in a little bee. Okay, and the, and, and the, and the little body, this little bee, it looks kind of like grass. So it's all, it, it, it kind of blends in. You don't notice it so much. You don't notice it so much. Uh, but when that stuff starts to die out, you do notice it. Now, so, so here, here's an example of uh, uh, a brown patch because of crabgrass. Now, this is early in March. Crabgrass, crabgrass germinates in the spring, okay? So this is called fescue, and this was a patch last summer at Bermuda, our student had uh, uh, crabgrass in, okay? Crabgrass died, it, it went frosted, and so it was dormant all winter. It wasn't dormant, it was dead, that plant was dead. The new seeds that started germinating. So now we've got this brown patch out here in the spring of the year that was caused by crabgrass that grew there before. And, and because the crabgrass was there, it outcompeted, choked out to the grasses. So we've got a brown patch created by the, 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 the death of the weed grass. All right. And we don't do anything to it, it's going to come on, grow back in, and we're going to probably spread some more, and we're going to have a bunch of crabgrass where it's all set up. Um, and here, this this picture lady in this night, this, this is little barrel, okay, kind of an overview. Now this is, this is actually in some removed grass. But to take a close up, there's that little barley. It, it, it's a winter annual, so winter annuals die in the late spring. They have to, they have a choice. They start turning brown. Every patch where you've got a, a high concentration of little barley, it's just ooh, It's brown. Brown. So move that screw up pretty good. That stuff is brown. Can't help it. It's got to be. call this got to die. It's an annual. It has to do that. So that's the case of wheatgrass creating a brown patch in the yard itself. Here's another one. It's got a mixed bag, but that's mostly tall fescue in the background. But this here, and then again, this was uh, uh, this was in uh, mid-May. This is annual bluegrass. Okay, the annual bluegrass, it's all little, it grows in the fall of the year, germinates just like the little barley does, same kind of tall fescue and all that good. This is probably the number one that, that I see for homeowners. And I say, well, my grass looks pretty good, but I got places where it's just dying. I got spots that just dying. And, and, and that'll start, depending on how the weather, how the spring progresses, any time from late April up into the first of month is when that starts happening. And, and so you ask, them, well, is it, are, are you sure it's tall fescue? Yeah, so it's tall fescue. <clears throat> but if you look at it, you've got little thin stalks of grass, and little seed heads at the ends. Man, that's a sure sign. Bluegrass just died. Okay, and that's the, I, I, I had three calls about last week. Well, I sold my grass. It was looking good until about two weeks ago, and I started getting these spots dying in the yard. Go look at them close. Do you see little seed heads at the ends of the brown grasses? Yes. It's just any bluegrass dying. Okay, any bluegrass dying. Um, 
can we, can we do anything about those? Well, you can. Okay, you can. All right. Annuals can be prevented okay, by the use of a pre emerge. Yes. But there's a rub there. There's a rub. If, if it's in a cool season grass, they germinate the same time that you think about sowing those cool season grasses. So you have a conundrum because the, the pre emerge can't tell the difference between a weed seed uh, or a good grass seed and a bad grass seed. So you cannot, you cannot prevent annual bluegrass and so tall fescue at the same time. So, so you're running into a problem there. Now, one thing that a person might want to do in a case like that, now if you have a bluegrass, you've got other options because there, there, there's chemistry that you can use to control outbreaks of annual bluegrass on the bluegrass if you don't have that same option to do it on tall fescue because tall fescue is not a problem. Uh, what a person might think about doing is do their uh, uh, do their don't don't wait too late in the season to do overseeding on tall fescue such as that. Uh, you know the earlier the, in, in September is a good month to do it. It, it may you know it, it may be a little dry in September. Uh, well, that's okay. If, if you can irrigate a little bit, that's great. You help that grass come on up. But you get a better start on it. The, uh, it, it'll have a chance to maybe outcompete and get some growth to it before you start getting as much of a little bluegrass to germinate because if you can shade the ground, that's a good weed control. If you can shade it with desirable grass, that's a good weed control. And think about where you saw, think about where you saw the, the bluegrass patches. You'll see bluegrass grow very well in shallow places where the ground is not very deep but grow in more compacted areas. So kind of remember where those spots are and if, uh, if when you when you sow the tall fescue in the fall of the year, you end up growing. Kind of watch those places where you saw uh, the bluegrass in years past. Because chances are you're going to try to see it start to germinate grow there. If you see some of it coming in, then you could use a grass product, you know, grass killer, uh, and kill those little patches and then repair those with seed if it's not too late in the fall. I mean, that's an option. You could also cut them out and put in squares of sod. Okay, that's another option too. But it is difficult. It is difficult to, to control emerged uh, wheat grasses like annual bluegrass and little barley in tall fescue. Uh, there are some chemistries that are generally not available to homeowners that do show some, some efficacy against those. But usually you're looking at using a lawn service to, to, have, to have access to those. So it's not, it's not a total. It's, it's not total uh, bloom and doom, but it's kind of bloom and doom. Never thought. Kind of bloom and doom. Other top. Now, on Bermuda grass, or excuse me, on crabgrass, you could, uh, uh, a good way to avoid that one is in the, in the fall year when you do your overseeding, you get a good stand of tall fescue where, where the crabgrass was, and that's going to help shade that and use, use your crabgrass preventer. And you could, that was a lot easier to keep it by. That was a lot easier. Okay, other areas or other causes of brown patches, use of grass is not suited to the environment. This is an example of, of a pure standard perennial ryegrass planted in full sun. For, for our environment, perennial ryegrass is not a good dependable perennial grass. It will not persist as a good thin standard grass when it's sown alone. Out in full sun, I mean, it just dies out. Like okay, same thing would be true if you use a fine fescue, for example, creeping red fescue. It's got to have some shade on it to grow. Okay, so if you plant it, a very high population of grass, uh, or grass needs to have a high population of creeping red fescue in, in full sun areas, that creeping red is not going to survive out there. It'll germinate, if you sow it in fall year, it'll germinate real well until we start getting into this time period and it starts to soak. So that's another cause for it. Um, well, there's one that, that, that unfortunately occurs uh, uh, way too frequently, and that's just drought. Okay, drought stress. Now, look at it though. You got you got brown here, you got green. That's a good example of how much difference there is in soil depth. Okay. Because you can just about bet that you are have a shallower soil here than you have right back there. And the same thing uh, on this one back here. In these areas, that ground is more shallow right there. Now, how is that? Well, uh, in homes, you know, there's sometimes a lot of grading work is done, dirt hollowed away, and then the other dirt is brought back in. And you need construction to bring buried around out there, bricks and blocks. And I felt like, um, 
it's uh, oh, I'm not going to call his name. It says there's more than one. I will say his name. Cut the turf dog. He told me. And, and so he's in, he's in the lawn care business. Uh, he moved to, I don't know, sometime back in the early 2000s from somewhere. And he, in the spring of the year, the grass looked really good. In his house, he bought the house. And then it got a little dry. And he started seeing this square. But it wasn't it wasn't rectangle like a septic tank, it was just a square. What in the world? They got to digging around down there, and there was a whole pallet of bricks. A whole pallet of bricks that they had buried there. Uh, yeah. I mean that's that's a lot of bricks. They had to dig a good hole to bury that. Now why would somebody do that? I don't know. But the point is you never know what's out there. You never know. There are some diseases that are not brown packs that will kill everything. And this is a this is called pithy. Pythium is a water mold, okay? And, 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 and look, look at that shape. Does that look like maybe? I mean, and who knows for sure, but very often it'll follow the path of water because it's a water mold. Well, you know, I can envision water flowing down through the earth, right? But, but so I don't know if I've got something other than brown patch. Brown patch usually does not kill everything in the patch. Pythium kills it all. Kills it all. There's another one called PayPal Pack. Kills it all. Okay, you don't have any green tissue left in there whatsoever. No. So that's something to think about. Uh, if you start getting brown patches like that, um, is, is it brown patch or is it another disease? Because other diseases can cause those brown patches and cracks. And it's not brown patch disease, it's another disease. Uh, herbicide and other chemical damage. Now that, that that's a wide, that's, that's a pretty broad category. Herbicide, okay, why would you have this roundup? Okay, somebody round up that? Well, why would they do that? Okay, well, let's say you've got tall fescue or tall fescue bluegrass or tall fescue bluegrass ryegrass mix. And you get patches of Dallas grass. That's a warm season broadleaf weed grass. It grows the same time of the year as crabgrass does, but it's like remote grass, it's a perennial. It comes back from the same root mass as the year. And perennial weeds are much more difficult to control than annual weeds are. Pre-emergence don't have any impact on this Dallas grass, but it's going to go back in the same route. It'll be just like the new grass. Does. And, and there, there, there are convoluted processes that an individual can follow and, and, and procedures and protocols to suppress the, the Dallas grass without necessarily killing your blue, your, your, your tall fescue and such. But life's a lot simpler just to mix up some glyphosate, which is what Roundup is, and go spray those spots. And then in the fall of the year, do your overseas. 